Hello, BookTube. This odd perturbation in the atmosphere that you see is called natural light. <laughs> it's called sunlight, which has been completely missing from Boston for a few days now, but it is back. It made a return today. We got a light dusting of snow last night. Quite pretty coming down, but not enough uh, to really be a nuisance in terms of discarding it, of disposing it, or getting out of the way the next day. It hasn't been warm enough today to warm, to evaporate any of it, but it at least doesn't require shoveling, which is one positive. Of course, it's not the positive that I really care about. The positive that I really care about is that it's not slippery. And it is intensely slippery everywhere outside. <laughs> it's, it's just the, the tiny dusting of snow that we have is perfect for covering the patches of ice so that you don't know you're on one until you hit one. <sighs> but uh, it was bright and sunny all day. I am once again, since this is where you go for your weather nattering, I am once again looking at two enormous storms, back-to-back -back storms, that look like they're going to affect almost all of the country, but especially you unlucky sods in the upper Midwest. I don't know why you live there, even though I used to live there. I don't know why you live there. But nothing like that here. It's a bright, sunny day, and it's nice not to have to load the place with artificial light. So I thought we'd go through a real brief mail haul. We'll look at some uh, periodicals first, including two back-to-back -back issues of the Bedford Times Press from Bedford, Iowa, a local newspaper, a light, thin local newspaper, the kind of local newspaper that will print the local 911 calls of the week, that has, as a decidedly non-local feature, my book column once a week. They run my book column in the Bedford Times Press and the uh, Lennox timetable in Iowa and a couple of other places. And it's a delight, an absolute delight to get, as I've mentioned many times, it's an absolute delight to get your own stuff in the mail. So this is, this is two different columns. I guess they just didn't get me an issue last week. Uh, how does this one start? Just to give you a taste. It's not a tease because it's, uh, the reason I'm giving you a taste is because you may know uh, the editor of your own extremely local small town newspaper who might want to add a bookish feature. Book readers are everywhere, so this, this is a bookish feature that is quite a lot of fun. It's good general reading. Uh, what's, what does this one say? This is from December 7th. I've recently had an infectious quote ringing in my head for weeks. One of those quotes that robs you of your peace and just won't go away. It's most commonly attributed to the great poet W.H. Auden, but I've seen it attributed to half a dozen other great poets as well. When in doubt, people just tend to attribute just about everything that isn't nailed down to great poets. They're the most likely candidates, aren't they? They say so much, after all. The quote is, some books are undeservedly forgotten, but none are undeservedly remembered. And then the column goes on from there. <laughs> so this, that was great. Always great to get yourself in the mail. I actually thought that was going to be... Uh, a hat trick. I thought I was going to get myself in the mail three times. Let me check here. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. No, that's not the case. Uh, I also got the Martha's Vineyard Gazette in the mail. Black and white newspaper. Beautiful photo photograph on the cover there. I am the book reviewer for the Martha's Vineyard Gazette. It's an island off the coast of Massachusetts. And I have a review coming up, but I think I'm in the next one. So this one's just uh, not just. It's a wonderful paper. It also is a local paper. It just so happens that that unlike in Bedford, Iowa, the, the vineyard is planted pretty thick with philanthropic millionaires. <laughs> so it tends to be a, a bigger, more elaborate production. And then the other periodical was the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement, which has a cover feature on uh, Yours, Lucian, a big, ornate, beautiful volume of uh, the letters of Lucian Freud, complete with his doodles. He filled his letters with doodles. I saw that volume this year. I made my way through part of it. I think I would have been far more motivated to not only finish it but love it if I liked Lucian Freud's paintings, but I tend not to. Uh, but there was an interesting thing in the letters page. A little earlier, I read you from the TLS letters page an irate reader writing in to criticize the TLS's review of Jared Kushner's book because it was critical of poor little Jared Kushner, who I guess is the hero of our time. And the letter writer wrote in to castigate, to say, well, you know, uh, he did a lot of good, mostly behind the scenes. He was a selfless, unsung hero. I, I yelled about that in my video at the time. And uh, someone else wrote in, from New York, of course, and wrote, 
Uh, Edward Luckrock describes the review of Michael Wolff's, of, by Michael Wolff of Jared Kushner's recent memoir as, quote, a grotesque misinterpretation of the book and the person. He goes on to say that Kushner patiently negotiated solo with the leaders of seven Arab countries and opened diplomatic relations with Israel. In doing so, I would point out, the letter writer says, Kushner went behind the backs of the CIA and the U.S. State Department. Yes, indeed, he broke the law to do what he did. Not that anyone cares or can even keep track. The letter writer goes on, Lutwak charges Wolf with, quote, suppressio veri, as if he were a liar. It is an odd accusation from one who fails to point out that Kushner has received more than $2 billion from the Saudis and others for a private financial venture. And it's not just the Saudis. It's Mohammed bin Salman who personally orchestrated, devised, and ordered the torture, dismemberment, and execution of a Washington Post columnist. Not only was he lured to the, his place of death, and not only were his pleas for mercy recorded for the prince's pleasure even though everyone in the room knew they would not be heeded, and not only was the columnist carved up with bone saws that his assassins brought to the room for that purpose, but then they wore his clothing for security cameras. They wore his clothing for photo ops, and Mohammed bin Salman made his family thank him. Uh, and Jared Kushner knew all about that. Jared Kushner knew about that before it happened. But he wanted to make an absolutely life-saving financial deal with Mohammed bin Salman to salvage a property of his that he could not get off his hands because of his own drastic boneheaded mismanagement. No behind-the-scenes hero. Not at all. <laughs> not in the slightest. Uh, there was also a, uh, a letter here that's a little longer that... Uh, I don't know what to make. I, it's, a, it's a quagmire to get into. I have often said in this, on this channel that there, under no circumstances should an author of a book write in to protest a review of his own book. That should under no circumstances happen. There's no good way to do it. If you catch an, a reviewer in a factual error, have your publisher correct it behind the scenes with the editor to run a correction. There's a correction on this letters page. Rather than air your grievances in public, I said the only reason why an author would ever really want to do that should be if the uh, the reviewer is giving a completely sales damning version of the book, and uh, Vernon Bogner, Bogdener is the author of a book called Str "The Strange Survival of Liberal England," and he writes of Liberal Britain. It got reviewed by Ian Cowood in the TLS, and uh, Cowood takes some very uh, uh, censor approved very twitter approved swipes at the book and the author felt behooved to write in and i have to admit he did a graceful job of it he writes uh i'm most grateful for coward's generous review of my book he may be right that i underestimated the corruption and brutality of british imperial rule but the examples he cites do not prove his point the indian famines of the 1890s were the result of a failure of the monsoon not brutality or corruption Tibet was not part of the English Empire, and the massacre of the Zulus in 1906 was carried out by troops of the self-governing colony of Natal, not Britain. The Amritsar massacre of 1919 and the bombing of Iraq in the 1920s lie outside my period. Elsewhere, Coward berates me for looking forward into the later 20th century. It seems a bit hard to be berated for also not doing so. Of course, no one... No one of sense denies that liberal societies are just as capable of brutality and corruption as other societies. The difference is that in liberal societies, there is scrutiny in the press and parliament and an attempt to put things right. The 1919 Amritsar massacre, for example, was the subject of a heated debate in parliament and a press outcry, leading to the establishment of the Hunter Committee, which unanimously condemned Colonel Reginald Dwyer, the man responsible, who was relieved of his command. Coward disputes my view that the Aliens Act of 1903 was not inherently anti-Semitic. The witness I quote was Chaim Weizmann, Zionist leader and the first president of Israel, who declared in his autobiography that the act, of, that the act quote, cannot be looked upon as anti-Semitic in the ordinary or vulgar sense of that word. <laughs> Close quote. Coward also disputes my view that the deaths in the concentration camps in South Africa were not the result of deliberate cruelty by quoting my description, quote, criminal negligence apparently not noticing the distinction. I do not share his view that the Britain of 1914 was conservative and backward-looking. Further social reforms were in the offing. Class conflict was being mollified. Opposition to female franchise was waning, and Ireland's goodwill had been won for the war effort. 
Incidentally, the hero of my book is not Henry Campbell Bannerman, as Cow would suggest, but Winston Churchill, whose prescience on social matters before 1914 seems to me astonishing. I would be willing to bet that the reviewer will write in to defend his position. If it happens, uh, I will be your Johnny on the spot. I will keep you appraised. Uh, then we have the one package from the mail. There's only one package. This is not going to be a long mail haul. Just put it mildly. I am needed elsewhere. <laughs> but let's see. Let's see what our one book is. It's a finished copy. So it could be December. It could be a one last straggling December book. Oh, my. Oh, my. No, I think this is a January release. Isn't this? Oh, God. I was wondering if I was going to get this. Yeah, this is late January. This is uh, by Richard Bradford. It is Tough Guy, his biography of Norman Mailer. Definitely don't want to block the bean. She seldom makes appearances, does she? We had a, such a wonderful experience on the dog walk yesterday. We were walking down a long sidewalk, and way in the distance, we saw another dog was coming our way. A dog and a walker was coming our way. And when the other dog saw Frida, he froze. And then he started stalking forward, and the look on his face was, I don't know, this little dog looks like a loser. And when he got a little closer and could spot fine details, he raised his right paw to help him concentrate on what he was looking at. Uh, and then he turned out to be completely friendly. And, of course, from that description, you can already tell that the other dog that we encountered was another miniature schnauzer. <laughs> I didn't have my camera. I didn't have my phone with me. So I'm with, with, they were nose to nose, these two miniature schnauzers. He was a male. He was about 15% bigger than Frida. Heavier muscles, even though they were roughly the same size. And adorable. Absolutely adorable. Which is, I want to stress, what my bean is, too, when she's behaving herself. <laughs> but anyway, what have we got here? So this comes out on January 17th. Uh, let's see here. Twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Firstly, in... First, just first, Seymour. Firstly, in 1969 for The Armies of the Night, and again in 1980 for The Executioner's Song, Norman Mailer's Life, okay, Norman Mailer's Life didn't win those awards. Norman Mailer did. It's a dangler, is what it's called. It's a dangler. It's the most popular, or the most common mistake in written English. Uh, Norman Mailer's Life didn't win those awards. Norman Mailer did. Uh, but, uh, and you could easily fix this. Uh, you know, but anyway, Norman Mailer's Life can't, comes as close as possible to being the great American novel. Beyond reason, inexplicable, wonderfully grotesque, and addictive. Uh, okay, but there's another element you're leaving out of the great American novel or any great American, uh, any great novel, and that is elevating. It should also be elevating. There's nothing elevating about Norman Mailer's life. Uh, I just, uh, he would have loved that. But uh, The Naked and the Dead was acclaimed not so much for its intrinsic qualities, but rather because it launched a brutally realistic subgenre of military fiction. Okay, uh, all right, I'm not meaning to, to pile down on this Bloomsbury publicist, but uh, you haven't mentioned The Naked and the Dead. You don't know, your reader has no idea what it is. Uh, and also, it was widely acclaimed for its intrinsic qualities. So, I don't know, uh, anyway, it was acclaimed not so much for its intrinsic qualities, but rather because it launched a brutally realistic subgenre of military fiction, Catch-22 and M.A.S.H., would not exist without it. <laughs> what would Joe Heller say about that? He, since you're saying he doesn't have any, he didn't have the creativity to create it, that idea of war on his own. And what are you going to say about all the World War One people who came, who lived through the war and wrote books just like that? Did they also somehow, by use of a TARDIS, need the naked and the dead? Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the author com combs through Mailer's personal letters to lovers and editors and enemies, lots and lots of enemies, but then again, lovers and editors pretty much covers enemies when it comes to Mailer, uh, which appear to be a rehearsal for his career as a shifty literary narcissist and which shape the characters of one of the most widely celebrated World War II novels. Bradford strikes again with a merciless biography in which diary entries, journal extracts, and newspaper columns set the tone for the study of a controversial figure. From friendship with contemporaries such as James Baldwin, failed correspondences with Hemingway and Kennedy's, the terrible but justified criticism of his work by William Faulkner and Eleanor Roosevelt, this book gives a unique, snappy, and convincing perspective of Mailer's ferocious personality and writings. Well, okay, <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> I'm definitely going to read this. Everyone in the world is going to write about this. Uh, and this comes out in uh, January. So that's our book. There you go. That is the mail, and it worked. Natural lighting is barely holding on here. <laughs> when the, the sun is going away. There's only so much I can ask of natural lighting, but... 
It held, so <laughs> there was the mail and some correspondence just so I could see your face. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.